I'm a big dude. I fully accept that. But going through all the players today and reading their sizes made me feel a little bit better. Now they play in the NFL and get compensated so much better than that. But hey, don't take this from me. It made me feel a little bit better. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Marty Time Brews, where I'm your host, John Delray. Today, we are going through the big dudes. Yeah, a lot of offensive linemen in numbers 60 through 80, and then also one very, very small human who we're going to be getting to as well. But first, before we dive into part four of this week-long series, going jersey number by jersey number of every single Packer, I've got just one news update to tell you about, and that is that second-round pick wide receiver Jaden Reed has officially signed his rookie contract. That means this draft class is done. Finito. Finally, all 13 draft picks have signed their rookie contracts. And now we can move on past that. Not that there was real anxiousness about like them holding out or anything like that, but still, it's an important procedural item to have done. And to have it done even before the shareholder meeting, that's a good thing, right? So today we are covering, like I said, numbers 61 through 80, okay? Uh, then tomorrow we're going to be wrapping up with 81, through 99, covering a, a more expansive array of players, I should say. Keep in mind, too, one last thing before we cover number 61. Next week does begin in the shareholder meeting on Monday, and then training camp begins on Wednesday. There are open practices next week on Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And my episodes are going to correspond with the training camp schedule. Yeah, for just a few weeks, we're going to deviate from the normal Monday, Wednesday, Friday pattern so that I can always give you the news of the day as it happens with training camp. So next week is going to be content on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then maybe Saturday. I might take Saturday off because it looks like I'm going to take my son to that training camp practice, in which case <laughs> I'm not getting a darn thing done. So uh, I'll probably tweet out my thoughts or something. But either way, next week and through camp is going to look a little bit different if you're a regular around here. By the way, too, uh, Connie, a regular viewer of ours, she told me uh, last night in the comments, she requested that I keep a special eye on Brenton Cox because she really wants to know about him daily at training camp. And I would just say... Like, I'm going to be there every camp, so if you've got things that you want me to keep an eye out for, or different things, different questions, let me know down in the comments, and I will do my best to keep an eye on that for you so that I can report back daily, okay? It's one of the benefits of being a, a small channel. You might as well request stuff of me. All right, so let's hit it. Number 61, no one. No one. It has been three days since we've had a no one number. Number 61. Here we are. No one taking that number right now. Same with Mark Rivera's old number 62. Unoccupied at this moment. Number 63. That goes to offensive tackle Rashid Walker. He was acquired in 2022, seventh round pick out of Penn State. Interesting fact about Rashid Walker, I just thought this was cool. He played his very first snaps in the NFL on Christmas Day. He played four special team snaps last year against the Dolphins. He was active for a total of seven games, but those that's the only game that he logged any snaps in. And he was on Christmas. I just think that's cool, like, to have an NFL debut on Christmas. What are his prospects? Well... He's part of the clump, right, of Luke Tenuta, Caleb Jones, and Rasheed Walker. Now, looking at the offensive line on the whole, and we're going to talk about this a ton today, but you've got your five definitive starters, right? And then plus you've got a sixth, whether that's Yash or Zach, whatever. Top six are fully determined. Then you need a couple interior backups, and right now that looks most likely to probably be Royce Newman, maybe Hanson, maybe Sean Ryan, right? And then beyond that, I just have a really hard time, unless Tanuta starts playing a little bit more guard, envisioning a scenario where they're going to keep on the active 53 all three of Rasheed Walker, Luke Tanuta, and Caleb Jones. Now, all three of them are very close bound, supposedly, in how the Packers view them. They're All three of them are kind of their, their longer-term developmental people at tackle, just like Yash was once upon a time. So I think Rashid Walker, given the fact that he was active for seven games last year, given the fact that he was actually a draft pick, they seem to be high on him. I think maybe of the three, he might stand the best chance. Maybe Tanuna edges him up, but regardless, I think he has a really good chance to make this roster and be that developmental tackle that the Packers always seem to enjoy having on the 53. I just don't know as if all three can make it with the math this year. 
Okay, number 64, that's going to be Antonio Moultrie. Uh, he's coming to us. He's a UDFA mini camp tryout from the University of Miami. Uh, he is very well traveled collegiately. He started out at Northeast Mississippi Community College. Then he went to the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Then he graduated last year from the University of Miami, where he only spent one year. And it's not like the guy was getting kicked off programs or anything like that. He just kept transferring, trying to get more playing time, trying to find a niche, trying to get a little bit more, a uh, little bit more acclaim, I guess, as he's going for an NFL job. Now, what are his roster prospects? They ain't great. You know, I closed yesterday's video by talking about Jason Lewin, a UDFA defensive lineman, and Moultrie's right here in the same camp. All of these guys, the top five at defensive line, very, very solidified, right? Clark, Wyatt, Slayton, Brooks, Wooden. And then are the Packers going to keep a sixth defensive lineman? They don't have to, but it's going to come from the combination, if they do, of Lewin, Moultrie, Chris Slayton, Jonathan Ford. Like So uh, he's part of a large collective that may be vying for one spot that might not even exist. That means your chances dang great. Number 65, that's going to be guard Chuck Filiaga. He's a UDFA from the University of Minnesota. He is six foot six. And 321 pounds. This is a large human being. And he used that gigantic frame at the University of Minnesota where he started at right guard last year. They ran for 2,698 yards and 33 touchdowns with him anchoring the Minnesota run game. Now, what are his roster prospects? Well, look, I already talked about this a bit with Walker, and this is going to be the common frame, but what's the math at offensive line? For Filiaga, specifically because he's an interior lineman, he's going to have to hurdle some of, like, Jake Hansen, maybe uh, Sean Ryan. Now, I know neither of those sound like, <laughs> yeah, it's impossible to hurdle those two. Yeah, I'm aware. It may not be that tough. But still, you know, those guys have been kept around for a while for a reason. I just, it, I, he, I highly doubt they're going to give up on Ryan so quickly. They seem to have a real affinity for Jake Hansen. So what are his prospects? Not great. Number 66, our first retired number in quite a while. This number is retired for the great Ray Nitschke. So no Packers are going to be wearing that ever again. Number 67, that goes to Jake Hansen, 2020 sixth round pick out of Oregon. Now, I had a few problems at the beginning of the year with Jake Hansen when they decided to roll him out as the week one starter at right guard. And I'm not sure MIT scientists have been figured out why the Packers even thought it was remotely a good idea to do that, even in spite of all of the injuries on the offensive line. And here's the deal. His PFF pass blocking score at the guard position was a whopping 20.6. If you're unfamiliar with PFF, their scale goes to 100. 20.6 is really, really bad. But here's the good news. It was the 13th worst score in the NFL. There were 12 dudes worse than him in pass blocking, which I found to be incredibly surprising. What are his prospects? Whew. I mean, look, as of right now, he is the only dedicated backup center on the roster. Yes, Sean Ryan has, has taken some work there in OTAs. Zach Tom absolutely can play center, but he may be going elsewhere, maybe starting elsewhere. The fact that Hansen is the only dedicated true backup center on the roster, I think, does him a lot of good. Okay, now take that and combine that with the fact that the staff adores him. They've hung on to him for years, years longer than I know a lot of people expected him to be held on to. So does he make this roster again? It's entirely possible, right? But eventually that clock has to run out, barring some real performance upgrades from Hansen. But hey... The positional scarcity may allow him on the roster again. Number 68, not a zilch, nobody. And I highly doubt new quarterback Alex Magoo when his number gets released is going to be one of these in the 60s. So no worries there. Number 69, David Bakhtiari, hashtag dinner for two himself, which he always puts on Twitter. He was the 2013 fourth round pick in Colorado. Here's the fact. Of offensive tackles to play at least 500 snaps last year, Bakhtiari was one of two tackles in the NFL not to give up a single sack or a QB hit, and he was the only left tackle of the two that did it. His pass blocking efficiency ranked him fourth in the NFL. Look, friends, I know public opinion on him is scattered. I know there's still concerns long term about that knee, but let's clear something up. That was not just an ACL injury. 
I've been shouting that forever. I know a lot of people who have. It was not just an ACL injury for David Bakhtiari. He did have to come back from an incredibly gruesome knee injury. And then what did you want the dude to do about having appendicitis? But he can play. He still can play. There is no doubt about it. What are his prospects? It dude's a lock. You don't just get rid of one of the best left tackles in football, right? Now, I know there's been some suggestions about the Packers potentially trading him during the season this year. And I got to say, I think it's incredibly unlikely, but I guess if you're going to follow that train of thought, maybe, but the Packers season would have to be absolutely disastrous for that to occur. I'm talking train wreck of the wrecks, right? Because by the time the trade deadline rolls around, if you're going to get rid of the left tackle protecting Jordan Love, you pretty much have decided that Jordan Love ain't your guy. And that means he's got to be horrendous to get that kind of evaluation only through the first like two and a half months or so of the season. So I don't think it's going to happen. A separation between the Packers and Bakhtiari is significantly more likely next year when Bakhtiari's cap number jumps to $40 million. Yeah, downright QB money for a left tackle. Now, don't be shocked, okay? I'm just going to say it right now. If Bakhtiari plays all year, if he plays like Dave Bakhtiari is capable, don't be shocked if the Packers approach him about an extension next year to get that number down rather than some kind of impending divorce between the two. Now, Number 70, Royce Newman. Yeah, 21 fourth round pick from Mississippi. Uh, last year was not Newman's best. He played about half of the total snaps that he did in 21. Okay, like half of his snaps that he did in 21. And yet still gave up 66% of the sack totals, 80% of the hit totals. Now, part of that could have been the fact that they played him at right tackle a bit. Like, he didn't really do that much in 21. The vast majority of his snaps were at right guard. Last year, about 100 of his snaps came at right tackle. Either way, it's not good, right? And he was superior in 21 than he was in 22. And frankly, that's not saying a ton. I know the Packers still have high hopes for him to be a developmental prospect. They're really hoping that he catches on. But man, I'll tell you again and again, Newman just doesn't do well blocking stunts. I don't think it's a, don't think it's a question for a lot of people. Here's hoping he just grabs on because look, his roster prospects, they're solid. They are. He realistically is their top backup for the interior offensive line. It's going to be an upset to see him let go. Realistically, he's their seventh offensive lineman, right? You got your starting five, and then you've got either Tom Riash in there at number six. And then who's next up? Especially if you're looking for someone on the interior, Royce. And he does have the versatility that the Packers so value along the offensive line because he can not necessarily do it at an all-world level, but he can play guard or tackle. He also can flip sides if you need him to. So he's a possible trade candidate, I guess I would say. Like if we're going through the preseason and Gutekunst just feels like we have too many offensive linemen, we're going to wind up cutting someone for nothing. Maybe Newman gets a look from another team because he does have quite a bit of experience and it's not like he's been awful, awful. So maybe I'm just, I plan on him on the 53 barring something unforeseen. Number 71, that's Josh Myers, the 2021 second round pick from Ohio State. He was incredibly durable in college, starting his last 21 games at the center position at OSU. Uh, but when he made it to the NFL, he suffered a knee injury and finger injury that held him out a total of 11 games. Last year, he was back to being an Ironman. In fact, he led the entire Packers offense with 1,047 snaps and played in every single game last year. What are his prospects? Dude's a lock. I know not everyone is the biggest fan of him, and I do understand. His play has been remarkably inconsistent. The highs have been high. The lows have been low with him falling down. But look, and, and the thing is, too, those highs and lows always seem to occur in the same game, right? Like, that's the thing. It's not like he's just good for three games and then bad for a game or like whatever. No, it's like, it's not even by quarter. It's individual plays where he does a great rep and then an awful rep, and it's just like back-to-back Almost like the Darnell Savage of the offensive line. Like, it's just baffling. But the Packers staff still has an unyielding belief in him, as, frankly, they should. Because we didn't really see that kind of up-and-down performance at Ohio State. And he missed so much of his rookie year. Coaches said themselves, as we were getting ready for mini camps and OTAs, that they really considered last year to be Josh Meyer's true rookie year. So they're expecting him to take a massive leap forward. They also talked about Zach Tom at the center position and how he was competing at everywhere from center to right guard to right tackle. 
But yet I haven't seen any indication that Josh Myers is in an actual battle with Tom for the center position. At least at OTAs, Tom was predominantly taking time at right guard and right tackle, with right tackle being the most prevalent with him going head-to-head with Josh. So he's going to be your starting center in all likelihood. And at the and even if he's not starting center, I won't be shocked at all to see them kick him over to right guard to get his power on the field and then make Runyon the swing. I, I don't know. Regardless, Josh Myers is a lock. Number 72. Caleb Jones, 2022 UDFA from Indiana. And look, I have seen this man up close. Both the training camp, the Donald Driver softball game. I wound up sitting like 10 feet away from where he was in the field. Um, he is six foot nine and 370 pounds. Now I know I've commented on his size before, but what I never realized is that six foot nine, he's the tallest packer. At 370 pounds, he is the heaviest pack the dude is both the heaviest and the tallest green bay packer this year and i'm not kidding if you ever have the opportunity to see caleb jones not from the stands where everyone's that big but i'm talking like up close holy buckets this is a huge huge human being now what are his prospects he's in that rasheed walker luke tenuta clump right I mean, caleb jones i don't think he's really got the flexibility to go inside he's so freaking big but he's in that mix of the three. He did receive the least playing time last year. And I'm not just talking like snap counts because no one had a lot of those, but I'm talking like in terms of being active for games, but he also missed a stretch of time with illness. So really, really hard to decipher what the Packers are going to be doing here. I know at OTAs, he was predominantly playing with the twos with Rashid Walker on the other side. So lots to be figured out here. Does he have a good chance? Yeah, absolutely. Would I be shocked to see him be the one cut of the three? No, not really. I wouldn't really be shocked if it were any one of the three. Not until we know more. Number 73, Yash Nyman, the UDFA out of Virginia Tech in 2019. Out of all players who entered the league with the draft year of 2019, Yash last year had the fifth best pass blocking grade for players who who played at least 600 snaps. That's for all offensive linemen, not just tackles. Everyone above him on the list was picked in either rounds one, two, three, or four. Yeah, that's right. The four guys who finished above of him, one of them was from each round. And then there you've got UDFA. Yash Nyman in that fifth best pass blocking grade. Dude's a lock, right? They gave him a $4 million tender to come back as a restricted free agent this year for a reason. He's not going anywhere. Now, maybe he's the trade candidate, but I I can't. That would only made sense if it were way earlier in the offseason. Now, at worst, Yash is your swing tackle. He's your number six offensive lineman if you decide to start Tom. So I can't see Yash going anywhere. Number 74, that's Big E, Elton Jenkins, the 2019 second round pick out of Mississippi State. He was the first Packers offensive lineman since 1952, Durrell Tetik, to be named to the Pro Bowl within his first two years. Yeah, Miles, if you're watching, shout out to you. Your grandfather is the last one to accomplish this in 1952, Durrell Tetik again. Uh, And even before that, I think the one before that was Charlie Brock from 1940. So, look, Yash is in pretty good company of Packers offensive linemen to make a Pro Bowl within their first two years. He made it in 2020, his second year in the NFL. If you're wondering about David Bakhtiari, he did not make the Pro Bowl until later in his career. However, the All-Pro accolades were coming in. Remember, David Bakhtiari was named to some All-Pro stuff before he was named to a Pro Bowl. Do we even need to address Elton Jenkins' roster prospects? Dude's one of the best interior linemen in football. He can play any one of the five offensive line positions. Whatever, we're done. Number 75, Sean Ryan, 2022 third round pick out of UCLA. The interesting fact about him was he was a freshman All-American. He was a true freshman at UCLA, and he walked in and started 12 games at left tackle. That's commendable no matter what. Now, he's a third round pick, okay? That tells me he's probably not going anywhere. He's third round pick in his second year. The only third round pick in their second year that I can recall got that like went anywhere was Amari Rogers last year. And I think there was some other stuff going on there, but Sean Ryan had about as nightmarish of a rookie campaign as has ever existed. Right. The dude didn't play, couldn't get in any of the rotations. And then all of a sudden he got hit with the, the drug suspension towards the end of the year. It's just a bad, bad, bad in every way. Rookie year. But 
the dude can play. Like, if you go back and watch him in UCLA, he was a legitimate offensive lineman with some positional flexibility. Packers picked him in the third round for a reason. He kind of, he looked like a Packer, played like a Packer with his versatility. I mean, it made sense. This isn't just some dude who is bad at football. I don't know if it was adjusting to the playbook. I read some rumors about that. I remember last year. I don't know if it was a coachability problem. Who knows? But the Packers are probably going to be patient with a one-year third-round pick for him to figure out whatever in the sweet goodness happened to him his rookie year. So because of that, his chances are good. I just I can't imagine they're going to move on so soon. Number 76, John Runyon Jr. in 2020 was acquired in the sixth round from Michigan. Uh, I made note of this tweet from Zachary Jacobson, a, a writer on Twitter, and it seems perfect here to say as a fact. Only four guards with at least 600 snaps in pass protection last season allowed fewer pressure than John Runyon Jr. He's also committed just two penalties in the 2,104 total snaps that he's played on offense since 2021, and he hasn't missed a game since entering the league. Look, is he the best guard on planet Earth? No. Could he use more power in the run game? Yes. But he's obviously good at pass pro. He's very clean and incredibly durable. You can do a lot worse than a sixth round guard than that. One way or another, this man is a roster lock. No doubt about it. Number 77, Kadeem Telford, UDFA out of the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Over 1,400 snaps in the last two years, starting at left tackle for UAB. He gave up a whopping three sacks over those 1,400 snaps. Also, his first two years in college, he played a combined 21 snaps as an inline tight end. Probably, I mean, like, look, he probably just in goal-to-go situations. He's six foot eight and 322 pounds. But look, he still played 20 snaps as an inline tight end, which I just thought was interesting. His roster prospects, I mean, it's tough. He's a big, big, big dude, just like Caleb Jones, but... I don't know. He's realistically behind that clump of three at tackle. Uh, it's tough to see. Tough to see a path to the 53 for that. Now, developmental practice squad to be the next era of Luke Tenuta, Rashid Walker, Caleb Jones. Yeah, now we're cooking and I could easily see that. Number 78, Luke Tenuta, originally acquired off of the waivers from the Colts. Uh, interesting fact, I was able to copy and paste from Rashid Walker's fact because he made his NFL debut on Christmas Day by playing four special team snaps, identical to Rashid Walker. Now, the difference is, after that game against Miami, Luke Danuta was able to keep playing. He got snaps in every game from there on out, which Rashid Walker did not. But still, that's cool. Roster prospects, copy, paste. Now, Tenuta may have a little bit more flexibility to kick it inside, so that does differentiate him from Walker and Jones a little but we're kind of splitting hairs here. Those three are very, very closely linked together. Number 79, that's Gene DeLance. Uh, he was a practice squad player last year. He also spent time on Arizona's practice squad. The fact here, I'm sorry, it's not a very happy one. Pass blocking is not really his forte. Over 2,000 snaps at the University of Florida. He gave up 12 sacks and 20 pressures. He did all of that despite one of those years, Florida ranking fifth nationally in the number of sacks given up. And I'm talking the good fifth, like fifth least sacks given up. And then there you've got him giving up 12 in the three years along with 20 pressures. He also had 15 penalties in that same time frame. It's quite a few. Now, what are his prospects? He was practice squad last year, potentially again this year. I just haven't seen anything from him to believe that he potentially is passing over the big three at tackle. And then number 80, a little dude. Yeah, a nice little change of pace to close this out. Bo Melton signed off the Seattle practice squad last year in week 16, so we really have not gotten much Bo Melton at all. He, the interesting fact is he ran the ninth fastest 40 time in the 2022 NFL Draft Combine. He ran a 4-3-4. Christian Watson ran a 4-3-6. Huh. So, I mean, look, does Bo Melton play that quick? No. Does Christian Watson play that quick? Yeah. So, like, I'm still going to say Watson's faster. But, hey, proof is in the pudding. It's, it's a fact. Now, what are his prospects? It's super interesting. Realistically, wide receiver six is probably up for grabs if the Packers opt to keep a wide receiver six, which I think they will. But you figure the first five are probably on pretty good lockdown, right? Watson, Dobbs, Toure, Reed, Wicks. And then number six is suddenly a discussion between seventh round pick Grant DuBose, who probably is leading the charge. 
maybe Bo Melton, because supposedly the Packers liked him in the draft, just not enough to pick him, and then they went and plucked him off of Seattle's practice squad. And wide receiver six traditionally would be more of a special teams role where Bo Melton is considered kind of a menace who's got good return ability, and they certainly could use that speed in the flying-type roles. So wide receiver six is going to be the super interesting competition to watch between Malik Heath, Grant DuBose, Bo Melton, maybe Jadakiss Bonds or Deuce Watts kind of sneaks up into the conversation. Maybe even Jeff Cotton. But super, super interesting to see what happens to Bo Melton. I think he's right there, possibly looking at that wide receiver six job on the 53. Join us tomorrow as we close out this series. Again, going through 81 to 99. And remember, next week, <gasps> next week, real football starts. That means the schedule changes for a little bit. But y'all, we made it. We made it. Thanks so much for joining me on Lombardi Time Brews. I'll be back tomorrow. Hope you are having an absolutely wonderful day. And as always, go Pack Go.